guys. I hope you're doing well. Uh, so as you might have seen this week, we have started uh, One Health module. One Health is an integral part of PGH. So the first session was introduction to One Health, where you kind of learned about um, some basics of One Health uh, as a field, uh, as an approach. So this next like, next session is going to be uh, focusing on animal health as One Health. So we're going to be looking at uh, how um, we can view animal health through a One Health lens. Uh, this session is going to be um, led by Dr. Yana Shura. Uh, Dr. Yana is a faculty member here at UGHC. Uh, she has been with us uh, for the past two, over, over a little over two years. Uh, Dr. Yana is, very, uh, is a passionate researcher. She has advanced the field of One Health on the continent and her research is very focused on One Health. She has a great interest in uh, snake bites. Um, she has uh, supervised a lot of uh, students' uh, practicum projects, uh, most of which have been published. Um, so she brings to this uh, session a lot of uh, knowledge in One Health and, and um, in research skills. So for those who plan to uh, have a concentration in one health, she, she'll be a great mentor. Um, and yeah, so enjoy her lecture. Uh, I will leave it all, uh, I will hand it over to Yana to continue the session. Hello, MGHD students. Welcome to this introductory lecture on One Health. Today we're going to be talking about the animal aspects of One Health. And if you haven't done so already, please make sure that you review the pre-lecture materials before you go any further in this lecture. So first of all, you should all know what One Health is by now. It's the intersection between human, animal, and environmental health with the understanding that these three are inextricably linked and need to be considered together as a whole in order to make meaningful changes. How do we do this? We do this by identifying the people and organizations who protect human, animal, and environmental health, and then helping them to work together through coordination, communication, and collaboration, so that they can come up with solutions to really difficult problems that achieve the best health outcomes for everyone. So why do we care so much about One Health now? It certainly isn't a new term. Today, we have the largest population that this planet has ever been, ever seen, with unprecedented population growth. This has led to a change in urbanization with rural people moving to urban areas. And of course, with urbanization, we have land use changes. We have forests that are cut down to make way for cities. When we have lots of people living in big cities together, we have increased contact and exposure to infectious diseases. Um, and of course, we have problems with air quality because we've cut down the forests, which really act as the lungs of this planet and recycle carbon dioxide back into oxygen. In order to feed all of these people, there's been a huge rise in industrialized agriculture, both of crops and of animals. When we have large numbers of animals living in confined spaces, not only do we decrease the biodiversity on this planet, but we increase greenhouse gases, um, which are problematic because they lead to global warming or climate change, as some people like to call it. Climate change is characterized by changes to the climate that include flooding, increased precipitation, decreased pre precipitation, such as drought, um, as well as decreases or increases in temperature. Climate change looks different depending on where you are on the planet. And in this photograph, I've highlighted what happens in the Arctic with rising temperatures, melting ice, and rising sea levels. The problem for these polar bears is that the ice they're standing on is no longer stable and it's rapidly disappearing. This means that the polar bears aren't able to hunt for their food. And it also means that the indigenous groups in this area can no longer safely find the food that they need to survive. So there are all sorts of problems associated with this. 
Lastly, if there's anything that coronavirus has demonstrated to us, it's globalization. This idea that people, animals, and diseases can travel at unprecedented rates across the planet. A disease outbreak that occurs in Wuhan, China can very quickly travel to the rest of the globe because of the way that people and goods are transported now. And beyond human and animal suffering, this also has vast economic consequences. So if we look at some of the diseases that have emerged and caused large outbreaks in the last 30 years, we can see that they've had large economic consequences. SARS is a good example of a coronavirus that actually emerged only in a few countries, China, Singapore, and Canada, but had devastating economic consequences of up to almost 50 billion in a very short period of time. So these diseases have global impacts. This is traditionally how um, government agencies and scientists worked. So we had those who cared about human health in their own silo, we had people interested in animal health in another silo, and we had those in environmental health in a third silo, and very little information was communicated across those three domains. What we've realized now is we need to break down those walls and we need to allow physicians, veterinarians, environmental scientists, and all of those other people involved in these domains to communicate freely in order to identify problems that affect all three, but then also to identify solutions. And what we've realized more recently is that we need to be more inclusive. So our umbrella, our One Health umbrella, needs to also include those in the social scientists, for example, those who help us to understand behavior change, and also economists. Economists are really good at helping us to use limited resources in really impactful ways. So before we go any further, we need to be on the same page about what an animal is. Animals are multicellular eukaryotic organisms that form the biological kingdom Animalia. And of course, technically, this does include humans. If you look at this figure, you can see that the kingdom Animalia is actually very diverse. We have flatworms, the platyhelminths, we have Annelida, mollusks, which include clams and snails, roundworms, and then of course we also have the vertebrates, which can include animals such as bears. And as I said, humans are part of the Animalia kingdom, but using a One Health approach, we do generally consider them to be separate. So how do I think about animals? I think about animals in these categories, which include vectors and helmets, uh, a category that is often associated with disease transmission, I think about companion animals, cats and dogs and horses and those pets that often live very closely with us. They might live in our houses or they might actually work for us. So we have a photograph here of a working dog in an airport searching luggage for drugs and explosives. Of course, there are lots of different ways that companion animals help us and we're gonna talk about that later in our lecture. We also have wildlife. And when we're thinking about wildlife, we should be thinking about wildlife that's terrestrial, like this giraffe, wildlife that's marine, like this whale, or wildlife that flies through the air, like this eagle. Captive wildlife is a separate um, category because these animals have um, a very different relationship with One Health. They have different risk factors or even social determinants of health, if you will. And lastly, we have livestock and draught animals. So these are the animals that we raise for food production or to do work for us. So we have an example of a donkey here pulling a very heavy load. You don't need to use these categories. This is just something that helps me to think through all the different animal aspects of a One Health problem. So what are we gonna be talking about today? These are the key animal aspects of One Health. But I wanna emphasize that this list is not conclusive. These are five things that I wanted to introduce you to today. And rest assured, you're gonna be getting lots more information about animal aspects of One Health. So we're gonna be talking about zoonotic diseases, including those that are spread by insect vectors. We're gonna be talking about the effects of trade and travel, food systems, human-animal environmental conflict, and human-animal bond. 
So let's start off with zoonotic diseases. So a zoonosis is any disease or infection that is naturally transmissible from vertebrate animals to humans, either directly or by a vector. We care about them because more than 70% of recently emerging infectious diseases are zoonotic. HIV, Ebola, and of course coronavirus are good examples of this. We also care because the majority of agents used in bioterrorism are zoonotic. And that makes a lot of sense because if you are at war with another country, then you want to inflict the maximum damage possible, which means affecting animals, which have a huge economic um, impact, as well as people causing the greatest amount of pain and suffering. It's important for us to think about transmission routes because they're complicated. People and animals can be infected by skin, through insect vectors, by fecal oral transmission, by air, by fomites, by inoculation, all sorts of different ways. And so when you are thinking about a disease, it's very important to think about how that disease moves through an environment in order to infect people and animals. And then of course, we need to consider that transmission is multidirectional. This means that we're not just considering how people are infected we are considering the fact that people can infect animals in the same way that animals can infect people. And this is the best way to control a disease. So let's talk about sentinels. Sentinel surveillance is monitoring the incidence of health conditions in a subpopulation in order to assess the stability or change in health levels of a population. So what does that mean? That means that we are looking at a person or a group of animals as an early warning system of risks in shared environments. Both people and animals can be sentinels depending on um, the danger that, that we are looking at. The canary in the coal mine is one of the best examples. And this actually isn't a zoonotic disease example, it's a toxicology example. So um, way back in the day, miners who were going underground in order to um, collect coal, we're afraid about toxic gases that would suddenly build up in these underground enclosed spaces. So they realized that birds were also very sensitive um, to these toxic gases and canaries in particular were sensitive. So miners would bring a canary down into the coal mine which are often very vocal and chatty birds and the moment that bird stopped chattering or fell off its perch then the miners knew that it had likely died because of toxic emissions and then were able to evacuate the mine as quickly as possible. We also have different types of sentinels in our um, TED talk video that you watched highlighting Dr. Tracy McNamara she demonstrated what happened when people did not think about um, the impact of dying birds on human health. And this was a situation where birds were a natural reservoir um, for a, a new infectious disease, or at least an infectious disease that was new to North America. And because of the ways that government information is siloed, human uh, doctors and animal veterinarians did not talk to each other or did not listen to each other in this situation and therefore did not prevent a disease outbreak before um, it started to infect people. In the video with Dr. Henley, you're going to be talking about bioaccumulation and biomagnification. And so fish in this situation are a sentinel for toxic buildups in waterways that could also affect people. And fish are a good sentinel because they have, um, they reproduce very quickly and are very sensitive to cancer causing agents. So let's consider now what makes a good sentinel. As I said, both people and animals can be good sentinels, but you want to pick one that is highly susceptible for the health problem that you are studying. So it can't be something that's resistant um, or asymptomatic. It needs to be something that is highly exposed. Um, and lastly, it needs to be something that's easily monitored. So there's no point in picking an animal species that's living way off in the jungle in a hidden area. You want to find a species that is um, close to your target population and that also very quickly shows clinical signs or symptoms that can be monitored through diagnostic tests, 
um, or other medical evaluations. Okay, so let's talk about reservoir hosts, and I've already mentioned them once today, but reservoirs are the primary host or habitat in which the agent normally lives, grows, and multiplies. It's often unaffected, it's either asymptomatic or non-lethal, and it often facilitates spread. So people, animals, and the environment can all act as reservoirs. And if you think about soil transmitted helmets, for example, they are an example of a pathogen, in this case, worms, that live in the soil naturally and are able to affect people. So what is the relevance of reservoir hosts to One Health? Well, they're important for reinfection, they're important for surveillance, and of course, they're very important for infectious disease control or eradication. So let's look back to our example of West Nile virus transmission. So as you saw in the video, birds are the natural reservoir hosts um, for West Nile virus. And the disease is spread between birds by a vector, and in this case, Culex mosquitoes. The virus can also be spread accidentally to both people and horses. And what's important here is that if we were to treat, if we think of humans and horses as our target population that we want to prevent um, getting ill, if we treated all of the ill people and horses, we still would not solve the problem because we haven't addressed the fact that the virus is naturally cycling in the bird population. So unless we think about methods of control um, in the birds and the mosquitoes, we're really not going to be protecting animals and horses. If you look at this life cycle and you are wondering why people and horses aren't considered to be reservoirs, that's a really good question. And the answer is that they are considered to be accidental or dead end hosts, which means that they're not the natural reservoir where the virus has been adapted and attuned to multiplication. So when particular birds are infected, they are able to become viremic, meaning that they have a large number of copies of virus in their system so that when the mosquito bites them again, the mosquito becomes infected. People and horses do not become viremic and therefore they're not considered to be natural reservoirs. Let's talk about surveillance. So I'm gonna introduce you to one of my favorite parasites, which is called Echinococcus multilocularis. And it's very closely related to Echinococcus granulosis, which is the cause of cystic hydatid disease, which is quite common um, in East Africa. So E. multilocularis is a really small tapeworm. It's about the length of a grain of rice and it lives in canid definitive hosts. It lives in the small intestine um, and these hosts can include wild canids, such as foxes or wolves, and it can also in, um, infect domestic canids, such as dogs. The worms produce eggs, which are shed out into the environment through fecal matter. The eggs are extremely environmentally resistant and can survive all sorts of conditions. And often they survive until they're accidentally eaten by what we call an intermediate host. So the intermediate host in this situation is a rodent host. Once that rodent eats the infectious egg, then they're really in trouble. The egg hatches, um, travels to the liver, and multiplies at a very rapid rate, almost looking like metastatic cancer. And eventually it can take over the whole liver and the whole abdominal cavity. The life cycle is completed when that infectious or infected rodent is eaten by um, a canid host. So that's the natural life cycle of this parasite. We also have people um, who can be infected in the same way as rodents. So let's investigate using a One Health approach. First, what are the reservoir hosts? And I encourage you to pause the video right now, look at the life cycle and come up with your own answer. If you thought that the reservoir hosts were people, then you were incorrect. People in this scenario are considered to be a dead end host because for them to contribute to the life cycle, they would have to be infected and then eaten by a canid. And that's a really unusual circumstance. 
if you felt like the reservoir hosts included canids, the environment, including soil, vegetation, and water, and rodent hosts, then you're correct. These are all areas where the parasite either multiplies or is able to survive in order to spread the disease further. You can also think about what samples you would collect in order to conduct surveillance. And I'll allow you to do that in your free time. If you'd like to check your answer with me, you're more than welcome to do that by email. Lastly, let's talk about infectious disease control. So let's respond using a One Health approach. So in this situation, how could E. multilocularis be controlled? And I'll invite you again to pause the video and consider the different ways that it could be controlled. If you felt that it could be controlled by simply treating the people who are infected, um, then again, you are incorrect because people do not contribute to the spread of this disease. Here are a few of the areas where the disease um, could be controlled. And when we think about infectious disease, the first step is to always think about the natural transmission um, cycle, in this case, the life cycle, and figure out how to break the cycle in as many ways as possible. So first, if we consider the fox, we wanna make sure that the fox is no longer spreading eggs into the environment. We can do that by deworming both wild and domestic animals. We also want to make sure that if eggs get into the environment, that they're not ingested by either rodents or people. So we could do this using um, good environmental protection controls. So for example, we might develop food production systems where canids are not able to access them. We might also implement really good wash measures in order to make sure that water is protected and also treated before it's ingested by other hosts. You might also um, consider a behavioral campaign for people to have less exposure. So um, this would be considering the different reasons why people are exposed. It could um, include having them um, wash fruits and vegetables that are harvested out of natural environments. It could also mean improved hand hygiene. And then lastly, we want to make sure um, that there is a break between rodents and canids so that canids are, are not infected in the first place. Um, and one of the ways that you could do this would be to reduce contact between domestic dogs and rodents through leash laws or other sorts of policies. You might also consider campaigns to reduce population densities of both of those hosts. So let's talk a little bit about the dilution effect. So the dilution effect is the idea that undisturbed habitats with high biodiversity have lower pathogen loads across an ecosystem. So in this case, we're gonna talk about Lyme disease and you don't need to know in-depth details about this disease unless of course you're interested. But what's important is that Lyme disease is a rickettsial bacteria that is spread between animals by ticks. So let's consider the first scenario that we can see in the, the diagram on the right side of the screen here. We have an undisturbed habitat with high biodiversity with lots of different animals. If we move forward, we can see what happens when an undisturbed habitat is changed. In this situation, we've gone from a beautiful forest into a farm with very low biodiversity. The farm is likely growing crops and of course, um, has very few wild animals because their habitat has been removed. So what is important to notice here is that all of the predators of one species has disappeared. And this is the white-tailed mouse, which is a very good natural reservoir for Lyme disease. So suddenly we have high population growth of one particular type of animal that was able to adapt very quickly um, with this land use change. And so we have a high population density with mice that are living closer together and therefore able to spread diseases closer together. It's really important when you're thinking about the dilution effect to consider the roles of competitors and predators. 
So both competitors and predators reduce host density, either by killing them or by other measures, which means that these um, animals, which are very good hosts for disease, live further apart and therefore are less likely to spread diseases. But then they also change the host behavior. You can imagine the difference between having a mouse running a room, around a room by itself with a person versus a mouse um, that is in the same room with a natural predator like a cat. That mouse with a cat is going to be far more careful about approaching humans and human habitat. So the take home message with this slide is that biodiversity um, ends up protecting people because diseases are less likely to transmit between the natural hosts, but then also you are going to have fewer um, of these natural hosts living in close proximity to areas of human habitation. So let's move on to trade and travel. And again, you can pause the screen if you want and think about all of the different ways that animals travel or are transported around this planet. Here are a few of the reasons that I came up with. So we have natural reasons such as migration. We have an incredible wildebeest, wildebeest migration that occurs between Tanzania and Kenya each year. We have natural dispersal. So we have an example here of a bird with a tick on its face. When that bird flies around, it's going to naturally disperse this tick into different areas and possibly even areas that didn't have ticks to begin with. We have, of course, natural disasters such as storms, which might destroy a habitat. Um, forcing animals to move. We have climate change, which we've talked about before. So if an area becomes flooded or it becomes a desert, um, it's going to change resources and habitats and force animals to move. We have trade, both legal and illegal. So um, illegal trades such as bushmeat um, and ivory are, are very often in the news because of the consequences that occur. But we also have legal trades such as pets and livestock that are moved from country to country and place to place. We have overpopulation. If you have a population boom of a particular species, then they're going to move in order to have more space. And part of that is because of the limited resources. Um, Resources can be limited because an, an environment is changing and it can also be limited because of competition um, and, and growth of particular populations. So if a particular animal does not have good access to sexual partners, water and food, they're going to move to an area where they can be more successful. And of course we have reasons such as conflict which make an area unsafe or entertainment, um, particularly of, of captive wildlife. So again, I invite you to pause the slide and come up with the reasons, a list of reasons or consequences of animals moving around this planet. The list I'm gonna give you isn't comprehensive, so I hope that you're gonna come up with some things um, that I wasn't able to fit on the slide. Here I think are some of the most important consequences of animals moving and animals being traded. So of course, first we have disease spread. We have a group of animals that can move from one area to the next, potentially bringing disease with them as they go. The other part of animals moving is that they can be exposed to diseases that they hadn't been um, exposed to previously. So this is the idea of moving between endemic and non-endemic areas. And if you're not sure about those terms, make sure you Google them and have a good understanding. We also have vector emergence. So we talked about climate change potentially increasing or decreasing the temperature or environmental conditions of an area. Um, and what we can see on this map on the left side of the screen here are warming temperatures in Europe that allow particular vectors, and in this case, mosquitoes, to proliferate and survive. And so um, if we have vectors that have an easier time of surviving, then we also know that there are going to be more problems um, with diseases in those areas caused by mosquitoes. Trade of, of wildlife can have um, huge consequences for wildlife conservation and some of the species that are really um, talked about frequently include elephants because of their tusks, 
pangolins because of their scales, and of course rhinoceros is because of their horns. And these are all items that are often used in traditional medicine, but have dire consequences for the conservation of wildlife. We have invasive species. For those of you who live or have visited Lake Victoria, then probably you saw um, hyacinth as a um, hugely damaging species that was brought into the area and then outcompeted other plants. The photograph I have here is of a Burmese python living in North America. So these pythons were brought as part of the pet trade, but um, they reach very large sizes, um, several meters across. And because of this, many people who bought pythons released them into wild. In some areas they died because it was too cold, but in the Florida Everglades is a good example of a place where the habitat was very similar to where they had evolved in Southeast Asia. The snakes very quickly outcompeted all of their competitors and predators. And as a result, were able to decimate the biodiversity of an area by killing and eating almost all of the animals um, that were there. So it's been very detrimental. Of course, we have um, environmental changes that can occur if you have a large group of animals that are suddenly living in a new area. Overgrazing is a very good example of that. We have welfare issues of the animals while they're actually being transported. Um, we have loss of biodiversity, which I've mentioned several times now, but the fishing trade is one of the best examples of biodiversity loss, where um, these very large trawlers are looking for one or two particular species and kill pretty much everything else that, that sits in their path. Um, pollution is another very important unintended consequence and a good example if you've been watching the news recently is the oil spill off the coast of Mauritius, which has um, leaked oil into a very important um, ecosystem sanctuary. And lastly, we have gender issues. So um, again, this is an example of Kenya where suddenly donkey skins became um, very coveted in China due to medicinal properties. Um, the Chinese invested very heavily in slaughterhouses and this has absolutely decimated the number of donkeys that are, that are now in Kenya, caused huge poverty in rural areas and also resulted in women having to take a much higher burden of, um, of jobs that, that demand a lot of physical labor. So next we're going to talk about food production systems. So as I said at the start, we have an astronomically growing human population. This results in issues of food insecurity, as well as issues of water insecurity. And so when we have a growing human population, then we've resulted in industrial growth of um, livestock species, including cattle, pigs, chickens, and, and fish, such as aquaculture. The result of this are problems with waste management. So on the left side of the screen here, we have an example of a manure lagoon um, where huge quantities of manure are stored and this land actually becomes unusable and unlivable um, because of toxic accumulation of waste. We also have eutrophication, and if you're not aware of this, there's a YouTube video link that you can go to, but it's the idea that fertilizers used to boost crop production leach into the water, um, promote algae bloom, which blocks out the sunlight and causes problems with oxygen, and then ultimately kills the fish. We also have land use changes. If we want to produce huge amounts of livestock, then we cut down forest, which puts people and animals in close proximity with wild animals. Um, we also have to grow enough crops to feed um, that livestock. And we also divert water systems, which can have problems for infectious disease control and transmission, such as schistosomiasis. And if you watch the New York Times video, then you got to a bit of information about Nipah virus, which is another emerging disease that has um, emerged in the last 20 years. So Nipah virus emerged because people started cutting down forests, which were areas where bats lived, replacing them with 
pig farms and then surrounding the pig farms with fruit trees in order to boost income. So the problem, of course, is that the fruits attracted the bats. The bats were natural reservoirs for Nipah virus and shed virus into the environment, as well as into um, the, the pig farms. The pigs became infected with Nipah, and because they were so crowded, Nipah was able to spread very quickly amongst the pigs. And then because of unhygienic farming practices, people were then able to get infected. So let's look at it one more time. We have deforestation so that people can build farms very close to the limits of, of, of the forest where wildlife such as bats live. The bats are natural reservoirs which spread disease to domestic animals. Once the domestic animals become sick, their human handlers also become sick and this causes um, a great deal of morbidity, mortality, and also welfare concerns. So let's move on to human, animal, and environmental conflict. And I'm not gonna go into a great deal of detail about this because all of these topics are, are too big to capture in this short video. Um, but we do have human-animal conflict that occurs from um, physical injury. So envenomation is a very good example of this. Um, people and snakes come into closer contact with each other, often because of land use changes and because of human behavior. For example, um, building grain storage areas that are close to places where they sleep. This attracts the rodents. And then the rodents, of course, attract the snakes. We have poaching. We've talked about that already. So animals that are killed or injured in order to get parts of them, often um, used for traditional medicine or artwork. We have psychological distress. This is probably most common to captive wildlife or domestic animals, such as dogs and cats, and is really problematic when they are kept in unsanitary conditions that are far too small for their natural behaviors. We have habitat loss. So what happens when we cut down a rainforest and we build a shopping mall? What happens to all the animals that used to live there? We have property damage. This often occurs when people, are, people build urban areas that maybe are in the way of natural migration routes or are very close to wildlife areas. And of course we have crop rating. So if we take away the natural environment of wild animals, then many of those wild animals will then encroach on what we then consider to be human space in order to get food, water, shelter, and other sorts of items. And this is often most common with the sorts of animals that we talked about um, during the dilution effect. So those animals that are generalists that can really easily adapt to changing landscapes um, are most likely to be involved in crop rating. And lastly, let's talk a little bit about the human-animal bond. So the human-animal bond is a mutually beneficial and dynamic relationship between people and animals that is influenced um, by behaviors essential to health and well-being, including emotional, psychological, and physical health. So approximately 9,000 years ago, wild cats started to become domesticated in the Fertile Crescent. Why was that? That's because people started developing the technology to grow crops and to store those crops so that they would have um, food security all year long. The storage of grain attracted rodents and similar to the story about snakes, having lots of rodents in an area attracted cats. And so now we had a mutually beneficial situation where cats were encouraged to live in areas close to people because there was a good food source and people permitted it because the cats were improving their food source. I think what's really important to consider when you're thinking about human animal bond or all the ways that we benefit from contact with animals is that this form of contact and the type of animals really differ according to culture and location. Um, so for example, if we're thinking about the Middle East, um, a person might have a really good bond with a hunting animal. 
or a hunting bird, I should say, such as a falcon that can go out into the environment with them and hunt for food on their behalf. We also have groups that might have a very strong cultural identity, such as North Africa with camels. They might consider camels to be um, a better source of banking than, than putting you know, actual cash into the bank. So they might have a huge pride in cultural identity with a particular animal. The photo on the bottom here is an example of a man giving a wild cobra a drink of water after a forest fire. And of course, I wouldn't consider a snake to be my best friend, but you can appreciate that in the Indian culture, um, a, you know, a, a great deal of value is placed around cobras. And so for this person, the risk of interacting with this wildlife um, is warranted. We also have lots of different examples of ways that animals help us. So we have horses that protect and herd cattle. We have dogs that help protect people. And of course, we have a variety of different animals that act as guide animals. So helping those people um, who are blind. So two points that I wanted to make clear through this slide. The first is that the interaction should be mutually beneficial. And that can be sometimes controversial, but um, both people and animals should benefit um, from the relationship. Um, and then the second is that proximity between people and animals, whether they're domestic or wild, will always increase the risk of zoonotic disease transmission, whether it is transmission of human diseases to people, uh, or sorry, human diseases to animals or animal diseases to people. And then of course, there are always risks of injury. So we've heard a lot about what One Health is, and I wanted to talk a little bit about what One Health is not. So One Health is not learning how to be a physician, veterinarian, and environmental scientist. One Health is becoming very good in developing expertise in your own area, and then working with teams of people from different areas of expertise to solve difficult problems. One Health also is not protecting animals in the environment only when it benefits people. The idea is that we protect people, animals, and the environment, and we consider solutions holistically. It's not just a global issue. It is something that is very important to clinical practice and communities, and quite often very good One Health interventions start at the grassroots level. And then lastly, I know I focused on many examples from emerging and infectious um, diseases today, and that's because that's my area of expertise, but I just wanted to make it clear um, that One Health is not just about infectious disease. It's about all sorts of problems that we experience as humans, animals, and the environment. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope you found this useful. Um, you are very welcome to reach out to me by email or any of the other course instructors if you need clarification. Thanks very much for watching.